It's working. Yeah. All right. Rupa. Oh, we have quite a good turnout here in the chat too. Excellent. Um, if anybody else thinks they might want to talk, um, then uh, you can find the Hangout on uh, Google, sorry, on Moodle Meetings at gmail.com. So um, it's, uh, I'm not sure, can you, can, can you see it on the profile and can you try and join or do we have to, we have to add you, I assume? Yeah. Um, David, you should have one. I did send one to you. Uh, yeah, Juan, where's uh, that? Thanks, Juan. Perfect timing. Anybody else uh, need an invitation? You can take up to nine. So only the people from the web chat can connect here, not like in the usual meetings where everybody can. This is only for people that has access to the web chat. Well, uh, so we might as well say hello and welcome. We explain what's going on. So we've got the YouTube, um, the the main YouTube uh, video is streaming out live to anybody. Um, should be clear. Good. Um, if you want to uh, make any comments, um, the back channel is on Moodle, Moodle Dev on Twitter, hash Moodle Dev. Um, if you already have access to the Dev Chat, then uh, in Java, then by all means get in there. And um, there's a lot of people here already, and we can chat more freely there. Um, but tweet as well. Uh, be interesting, maybe we be able to see some stats later on how many people are watching uh, via uh, YouTube and Twitter later on. But um, actually, if you're hearing this now um, and you aren't, aren't in the dev chat, it'd be quite nice to send a tweet to the tag just to let us know you're there. Um, and we'll get started. Uh, Helen says it's Michael. Are you writing notes? I am writing notes. But yes. could you do a, a roll call? Could you ask for a roll call? Well, I can roll. ask for a roll call. Can everyone who's in dev chat just say hello? So we have 32 people. What do you want up there? Huh? What do you want in the top? Ah, excellent. What do you? They realized we knew that they were there. I disappeared. <laughs> Just gonna get them to hellos, Mark. <laughs> well, that's fine. At least we know who's there. Yeah, as a record. Cool. Well, okay. So, um, well, let's 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 move on. Um, we uh, got a this little agenda here. Um, you know where the page is, and um, we'll mostly be focusing on two point five. Um, Let's get back. So it's what we're talking about today. There'll be, if there's time at the end, um, any other issues, please bring them up. Um, it's um, <clears throat> a little difficult to sort of interrupt, probably, but um, try and interrupt if something bad seems to be happening, and uh, we'll try and make it all work. This is all a bit of an experiment, trying this way of doing things, but uh, let's see how we go. Um, so I just wanted to start off with a little bit of news from HQ, um, which um, is pretty new. But I started talking about it to Moot, so I thought I probably should talk about it here as well. 
Um, so as you know, uh, for the past uh, couple of years, we've had this rough um, arrangement of the teams in Moodle HQ. Um, the, um, so we have a, a basically a dev team for new developments, and we have a stable team looking after um, maintenance of all the branches that are in support. And uh, the integration team that takes the fixes out of those, and also from contributors, um, which uh, you know, just comes from all of you and everyone else around the around the world, <coughs> and gets into Moodle eventually. Um, so we had a bit of a uh, we were having some issues with with some of this, and that the the lines were starting to blur between the two teams, um, and uh, that. Um, I think there wasn't really a good balance of things going on. So we're, we're trying something a bit new, which is to reorganize the teams into um, um, a front-end team and a back-end team, and both of them will handle new stuff and bugs. Um, because we find often when you are working on big new features that they, there's kind of a big trail of bugs that comes <laughs> after them, after you've sunk the main thing. Um, so it makes sense for the same team to be handling those um, for a while, and um, we'll see how this works. Um, we're still we haven't started this year. We'll be starting in the next uh, week or two, about the time of the two five release, and uh, uh, we'll keep you informed. Um, actually, this manage circle here, and for the I was talking to the New Zealand MOOC this morning, and I called it a menage a trois, but because um, there's three teams there. But um, I'm not sure that worked, so I changed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me just talk a bit more about the details of these teams. Um, there's a uh, the the front end team is it's not just the like definition of front end that's um, you know you might be thinking of uh, in a classical description of what happens on the web. It's just roughly like that. So. Why I'm thinking about is the front end team focuses on usability issues. Um, the um, especially mobile is a big focus right now, um, and features and affordances. So that's uh, basically things you can see. So it includes all the uh, activity modules and um, most of the plugins that you can see. Um, the the back end team focus on most of the stuff you can't see, the logging, reporting, APIs, performance stuff. Um, Moodle is a development platform, so making it better as a platform to develop on. Um, and I'm sure you know all the kinds of things we're, that fit in there, that we're always fixing and improving. Uh, there will be some crossover, but it doesn't matter too much um, that uh, what matters is people are mostly working on the same kinds of areas and, and getting skilled in those areas and that uh, these two teams will be having daily scrums to talk about those things and uh, working together on big new features as, as a group um, rather than too many people splitting off uh, doing a feature each. Um, the integration team is mostly unchanged but I've sort of for the, sort of wrapped up testing and integration together because they are kind of they are very related. And there's testing at all stages through integration, and um, so as well as the reviews that you know the integration team do, still do this. They enforce standards and um, uh, QA. And the last team is the sites team, which focuses on the Moodle websites and managing plugins, as well as all marketing and education. I know that's a horrible word, but we do need to talk about what we're doing, <laughs> so that's what that is. Um, and I go down and even to even more detail still, but probably don't need to too much. Probably the rough priorities as I'm seeing them are like this, but they may change once the scrums get a hold of them. But uh, logging is pretty much first thing for back-end people, um, and the first big project. And these are some of the other ones, uh, notifications and so on. And front-end stuff, uh, Moodle Rooms right now are working on Outcomes 2, but there's going to be a lot of work for Moodle HQ getting that into core um, and fleshing it all out for 2.6. And mobile interfaces, mobile app, 
Juan's going to talk about that later on today. Uh, course management. Um, Sam's almost pretty much done that. It didn't quite make two five, so that that'll uh, come in two six. Uh, all the activities, analytics, things like that. Uh, um, but a lot of it's going to be getting this Bootstrap interface working awesomely um, across all platforms. Integrators are doing pretty much what they've always done, uh, integration <coughs> testing. Um, David's going to talk about his BHAT stuff, which is awesome. Um, there's loads of new tests getting added to the CI server all the time by the integrators, and um, that's quite interesting too. I don't think anyone was talking about that today, but um, if you go to integration.moodle.org, you can see the Jenkins sort of site there, um, and so on. And lastly, for the sites, uh, the main priority right now is moodle.org. Um, we've got to finish off this revamp that we started about a year ago, get it out there, um, make a much cleaner site. Um, Mooch got renamed to moodle.net, and that's going to be the name it's known by for. Uh, foreseeable future, um, so all content goes there, all OER stuff. Uh, plugins, uh, obviously a big focus, and ARPU is now pretty much full time on that. Um, and you'll see uh, just today that some of the new stuff that he was working on landed. So the install buttons for Moodle 2.5 are now on Moodle.org, and you can see them down here on the bottom. Um, is someone talking about that later? I think so. And uh, yeah, Moodle Docs, and we've got some videos uh, playing as well. We're going to be making more videos, um, overview videos about Moodle. And that's all I want to talk about. So um, moving on to 2.5, um, you, you may or may not have seen that there is a, a new features page. Uh, so this complements the release notes. The, the release notes are all the details, the technical stuff, and you really should look at them if you want to get the full uh, details on what's new, what's, what might be breaking, any API changes, etc. cetera. Um, but this is a new page that's going to be coming out with every release, uh, which is just the, the skinny about the new features with some screenshots for <coughs> showing people or getting a quick overview of what's going on. So if anyone's blogging about it or tweeting about it, this is probably the page to link to. And uh, Mary Cooch is doing a great job putting this together and uh, with others helping. So um, uh, that's a pretty good quick overview. But now we're going to go into a bit more detail and talk about it more from a technical point of view, I guess. So um, first up here, we've got uh, the Open Badges stuff, which is awesome um, from Totara. Totara and uh, Simon Coggins is, is online. So over to you, Simon. Okay. Uh, hi there. Just checking that everyone can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm going to do this presentation. Um, most of the work for Open Badges was actually done by one of our developers called Yulia, and I'm I'm hoping she's available on on the group chat. But I didn't quite realise it was going to be the developer chat. So uh, is, there, is someone able to see if she's in, in conference.moodle.org? Yeah, she's there. She's there, OK. So, um, so yeah, so the plan is, is, is I'll give the talk today because she's feeling a bit sick and probably uh, has a bit of a croaky voice. Um, but if you've got any questions in the dev chat, then, then Yuli will get back to you. Um, and hopefully that'll all work, work really well. Um, and can you see my screen OK? Yeah. You can. Cool. OK. Um, right, so I'll get started. Um, so so the Open Badges project is actually a, a Mozilla project. And I thought I'd just give a little bit of background on that first. It's basically um, a project by Mozilla designed to kind of be an open standard for achievements across the web. Um, so the idea is that you, you know, when you're doing things on the web, like online courses and, um, you know, anything you're doing online, really, you, you might uh, learn stuff, you might get achievements, um, but there's no real way of kind of gathering together those uh, achievements and sharing them in a single place. So um, basically, it's this open infrastructure. Uh, the main website's openbadges.org, and uh, you can find out more. 
Um, and the, the, the system works that, that organizations uh, issue badges um, and users can earn those badges. And they have this concept, uh, which is got a slightly strange name, called a backpack, which is basically a place where you can collect all your badges together, you can group them, and you can choose who you share them with. So it's basically a sort of repository for your badges that you earn across the web. Um, one of the really cool things about badges is that they're kind of they're really easy to share. They're basically just a, a PNG image file. Uh, at this stage, that they're, they're going to add SVG soon. Um, so, so you just get a regular PNG file, so you can email it, you can upload it to your website, you can share it on LinkedIn or, or your Facebook page, and it just looks like a normal PNG. Um, but uh, embedded within the metadata of that PNG is actually a mechanism to allow that badge to be verified. So if, if you show off your badge on your web page, someone can download that image file, and they can check that that badge uh, belongs to you and that you did earn it from the institution that you're claiming you earned it from. Um, and that's done basically by a, a sort of assertion that's built into that metadata. Uh, and I think that's that's really key. Um, and one of the really interesting things about this, it's not just you know this idea of you know awarding uh, badges for achievements and the kind of gamification of education. It's it's actually more like a digital certificate. You can actually prove that you've got this thing uh, for what you say you have. So you know it could be more than just you know well done, a gold star for for your gaming achievements. It could be you know this is my degree certificate or my my university certificate. Um, and um, you know, taking it beyond that in the future, perhaps it could even get to the point where instead of doing a degree from one university, you could you could kind of look out and see what modules all these different universities are doing online, and pick and choose the learning that you want to do from lots of different places, and and the the idea of the badges could could kind of um, allow you to do that and, and do the learning on your terms rather than having to get a whole degree from one institution. Um, so that's a little bit sort of beyond <laughs> in the future. There's still a lot of work to be done. It's still quite early days. Um, but uh, I thought I'd show you what we've done, which is basically integrate open badges into Moodle, um, which means Moodle can issue badges uh, and it can also uh, sort of display badges that people have got from other sites. Um, so we've got a demo site actually up and running. It's at openbadgestotra.elearning.catalyst.net.nz. Um, so um, that's online now, and there's there's a couple of test accounts. Um, it does occasionally get reset uh, the data, and you, the, they're just a, a teacher and a student account, so there's not not really full access. But um, you can have a play, and you can issue badges. Uh, you can create badges as a teacher, and you can issue them, um, and that will keep that live until until 2.5 is out and the Moodle demo is up so if people want to have a play with it in the meantime they can. Um, so I'm gonna just walk you through a very kind of quick uh, run of what uh, what it might be like using open badges in, in Moodle. Um, okay so the first thing that we we have in Moodle that is kind of relevant is we have this concept um, of, of the type of badge. Uh, badges can either be a site-wide badge or a or a course badge, and um, the, the purpose here really is is that site badges can be awarded for achievements that extend beyond a single course, so maybe completing a set of courses or doing something at a site-wide level. Um, course badges, on the other hand, can be the, they can be delegated, the responsibility for them can be delegated to whoever's managing the course, like the teacher, um, uh, so they can issue achievements within the course that they have control over. Um, the, the site badges, the main place to manage badges is, is here in the site admin menu under badges, um, uh, whereas the course badges is inside the course administration. So really those are the only two, uh, the, those are the only two differences. Oh, one more. Um, the, the criteria that you can uh, use to create badges is slightly different uh, between site badges and course badges because you've got access to different things. Um, so um, I'm not going to show you the the uh, uh, side badges, although it's basically the same functionality, just uh, at a side level. I'll, I'll focus on on what it might be like for a teacher and a student. So just log in as a teacher. Okay, um, so I've created a course here. 
and I've just got a couple of activities in there. Um, I'm, I'm actually using activity completion here for this course, so uh, one of the criteria you can use is, is you can award badges when people achieve particular activities within the course, so I, I've got that enabled, and I've set up a forum here that you need to post to in order to complete that activity, so I, I did that beforehand. Um, so let's say we want to create ourselves a badge, so uh, here we are, open our badges menu, and I'll add a new badge. So the um, the teacher basically gets to uh, define what their badge is like, so let's say um, social participation. Um, and at this stage you um, basically need to provide an image badge to exist. Uh, at some point in the future we might um, uh, we, we might add some kind of authoring um, abilities to uh, to allow you to um, you know design your badge within the interface and especially once the uh, the SVG format is supported it'd be possible to you know customize it with the user's name and things like that but at this stage badges are just uh, just an image um, so uh, you can also do things like badge expiry, so you can have the badge uh, only last a certain amount of time. I'll just create a, a regular badge here. Um, so the first thing you have to do when you've created your badge is, is define the criteria, so what do people need to do to earn it. Um, there's a few options here. Um, within the course you can, you can have it manually issued um, by, by the teacher or a different role. Um, you could have a badge that's uh, earned for completing the whole course uh, or in this case, we're going to we're going to use a uh, single activity, uh, or you can have multiple activities. So um, just to keep things simple, I'm going to say, okay, you need to post into the forum, and uh, you can have you can combine these. You can have multiple, so you've got to do lots of activities. But we'll just do that one. And um, you can also have multiple sets of uh, of criteria. So here I've just got one, but we could we could combine others uh, um, together to make sort of more complicated uh, criteria, uh, but that will do for now. Um, okay, so you'll see here um, it's not currently available. Um, before you um, can issue the badge to anyone, you need to enable access, which is a bit like sort of uh, show hide for courses. And the reason for that is you might be building your criteria and you might have more criteria to add, but then someone could meet the criteria immediately, and if the badge um, would active straight away you could end up issuing it uh, before you meant to so um, you have to take this step to make it live uh, just look at the other settings before we do that um, you can have emails sent out to the recipients um, and because it's just a PNG file we can actually attach the badge uh, to that email so if you have a copy hard copy offline um, as the badge creator you can you can either get an email every time someone earns it or you can have a, a digest uh, so so you, you get informed every so often that there have been some new um, badges awarded. And um, you can also see who's awarded the badge on this page, which no one has yet. So I'll just enable access to this one. Okay, so that badge should be live. Um, uh, when you enable it, it checks to see if anyone immediately meets the criteria, and if they do, they'll just get the badge straight away. So. Um, I've got a student account here, uh, which I haven't logged into. So I'm already enrolled on this course. Um, so as a student, if I want to see what badges are available within the course, um, there's a new, new page here called Course Badges. There's an equivalent at the site level as well under Site Pages for Site Badges. Um, so I can see here uh, this badge exists, um, I get a description name, uh, and I get to see what criteria I need to meet in order to achieve this badge, so I can immediately see whether um, something I might be able to do. Uh, if I've already been issued the badge, it'll uh, appear here and link to my copy of it. So um, so let's say I'm really interested in this badge and I want uh, to earn it on my site. Um, so to do that, I need to uh, post it to the forum, so I'll just do that now. So the criteria for this is all actually set up within activity completion, so uh, it's the same as if you were um, uh, doing activity completion for 
course. So, and we're trying to kind of keep it that way because it feels like we'd be reintroduce or duplicating the same functionality if we have um, uh, lots of kind of uh, details about how you achieve things inside the badge criteria. So, for activity completion and course completion, uh, you can use the existing settings. Uh, there are cases where there's different types of completion that kind of sit outside that, and for that, we've got our own criteria, and we can extend those criteria quite easily. So, uh, let's see. Okay, so I'll post that to the forum. So, um, it should be instant. Um, uh, it's all kind of hooked into activity completion, so I should um, get an email. Um, I think this is the right account. I can't remember what email I set up. Ah, there we go. Okay, so um, I get an email which is based on that template. I've got the badge attached, and I can just download that. Um, and that's a real fully baked badge that meets the Open Badges uh, spec, and I can upload it to my backpack if I want or do whatever I want with it. Um, okay, so just going back as a teacher now, uh, here, if I reload this page, so I can see someone's received my badge uh, now, I can see when it was issued, and I can, I can view the details as the uh, teacher and see um, who got it, uh, the criteria, um, what evidence they achieved in order to get that badge. Um, so as a uh, student, uh, when I earn badges, uh, the main area for kind of managing them is this My Badges page uh, under my profile. Um, so you can see here, uh, uh, this user's got a um, couple of badges. I earned one, earned one earlier. Um, so you can see all the badges that you've received here and uh, um, control what you do with them. You can download them all, you can search for one, uh, you can download the file or, or change the visibility. Um, the visibility affects uh, uh, who can see it on your profile. Um, so if you want people to see your badges, you make them visible and then they appear on your profile page. Um, the other other thing we've got here is is the concept of a backpack. Uh, so this is, uh, as I was saying, Mozilla have this this concept. Um, and what you can do is you can connect your backpack. So if you have this, if if you've got an account with an external backpack, you can choose to connect it to your Moodle site as a user, and that allows you to uh, first push the badges you earn on this site out uh, to your backpack, so you can share them across the whole web. And secondly, it allows you to pull badges in. So if you've earned badges from outside that you want to show people within Moodle, you can do that too. Um, so to do that, you you connect to a backpack, and this is hooking into the um, into the use my personal account here, and you can see it says I'm connected there. So when I go back to the my badges page. I now have um, I have an extra option when I view this badge. Um, I can say add to backpack. Um, so I'm going to give this a go and see if it works. Um, so as I said, this is kind of uh, this is uh, the Mozilla interface for this kind of thing. Um, they use Persona for the login for um, uh, Open Badges. So um, I'm sure if you've heard about OpenAuth, I guess. Uh, it's quite cool actually. Stuff you can turn off. So if you're if you've got a site with kids and they're not able to um, create external accounts or anything like that, you can turn all this off. Um, we are hoping to um, actually make um, Mahara, which is a e-portfolio system, into a, a badge, um, a backpack provider, maybe at some point, which would allow you to kind of do single sign-on and not require this external service. So um, I can see the details of this badge that I'm talking about earning. I'm going to accept it. And you see there I've sent it to my backpack. So I'm going to go here now to, to the backpack. So this backpack, this is the kind of Mozilla reference implementation of a backpack. And the idea is that uh, this is a sort of federated thing, but because it's new, there aren't any other backpack providers yet. But in the future, there could be lots of different backpack providers. 
So um, here you can see my social participation badge has, has come into my backpack and they have this concept of collections here, you can group badges together uh, and importantly you can, you can make uh, collections public. So I'm going to create myself a new um, collection here, uh, call it um, Um, this is going to be a bit weird because I'm I'm kind of pushing badges to my um, backpack and then I'm going to pull them back into my backpack. Normally, you probably have different badges in here because I don't have any other badges from other sites yet. I'm doing it this way, so I've just created this group. Uh, you can drag badges in and, and decide which ones you want people to see, and you can make certain groups public. So you see here, I've got a couple of uh, public groups with a badge in each. So as a student, if I go back um, to the site here. Um, uh, you see here I can show badges from other websites so I'm going to add some collections um, and because I've made this connection this area here appears so I can, uh, I'm going to choose to show my little badges on the external area as well so save that and so then you can see I've got this connection I can modify my settings and if you view my profile, so you'll see in this case, you'll see uh, the badges appearing twice. Uh, but So these are your internal badges, and these are your external badges. And as I said, if you, um, if you don't want to show some of the badges you've earned, you can um, choose to hide a badge. So we'll, we'll say we're not going to show that one on our profile, um, and it will disappear. And you can also... Um, uh, there's a profile under here under profile settings. You can you can choose to make that the default. So when you earn new badges, they they don't appear by default, and you have to enable them. Um, so uh, that's really just a really quick walkthrough. Um, it's still in its early sort of days. Um, uh, there's still more lots more stuff we could do, and, and hopefully will do. Um, but I think it's it's quite an exciting project. It's going to be quite interesting to see. Um, how people choose to use it, and, um, and hopefully, you know, there'll be a much, uh, you know, with Moodle supporting open badges, there'll be a much bigger sort of uh, marketplace for badges. There's a lot more sites that can issue them than there previously were. Um, so that's it. I think uh, I just really want to quickly thank uh, Yulia for all her work, who, who did all the development of this, and also Moodle HQ for um, for getting it integrated into 2.5 and you know helping with uh, all the reviews and fixing bugs and stuff like that. So thanks very much, guys. And that's all I've got. Uh, it's a good overview. Thanks. Uh, I had two questions. One was uh, about Mahara, which you already answered, um, that, that integration. And the second one was, um, uh, is there any, have you had any thoughts about, uh, is there any, about making something inside Moodle maybe? I mean, could plugins generate badges? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, uh, I hadn't really thought about that. It's, a, it's an interesting idea, and I, I don't see why not. I mean, um, the the badges library is is pretty independent. Uh, the thing that actually generates the badges. So um, probably, uh, if people, you know, probably at this stage, a developer could do it um, just just by hooking into the badges functions. Um, but yeah, definitely an interesting idea to make that more accessible through web services or or something, so that people could actually um, yeah. issue badges. Yeah. Um, as, as for the Mahara side, um, that's the kind of next part of this project, really. Yeah. Our intention is initially to make Mahara a displayer of badges, so it would do the kind of pulling in from an external backpack, which would less, at least link, let you kind of link badges you've earned um, by going via an external backpack. But after that, we'd really like to maybe be even be able to issue badges through Mahara, and and the idea of making it a backpack and a central location for storing your badges is, is quite an interesting one. So, yeah, there's more to do. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, very cool. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Simon, and you, and Yulia, of course. Uh, even though you're, you remain silent to us, but um, uh, that's uh, no, it's good. Well, I'm really glad we got that in. So, very cool. Thanks, thanks a lot for staying up too. Um, <laughs> no you worries. Need to, to pike out and leave. Totally understand. So, okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks heaps. Is there any other questions from anyone else, or while they're here? There's some in the dev chat. Are you in there, Simon? Julia. I'm not, no. Oh, yeah. yeah, Yulia is answering, answering in there. Um, okay, cool. Uh, I'll quickly just check Twitter. See if 
Anyone else? Let's find an image down here so we can. Which one? The one with us. No. With us? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, plenty of questions you can go to the, the look at the docs and try the demos. Um, I think Simon answered all the questions that could help you. Thank you. Well, uh, the next thing on the list is um, bootstrap themes. Well, I put myself down there only because I didn't know if anyone else wanted to talk about it. Um, but uh, I haven't done most of any of the programming. Um, so there's been a bunch of people involved in that. Um, Bass Brands, of course, uh, Dave Scottson, um, Mary Evans, and um, a cast of dozens growing, to participating now. Um, so uh, let me just say. Summarise in, in short what we've what, what's happened. Um, so Bootstrap is a, a framework for HTML CSS development that's very popular with designers. Half the websites in the world these days seem to be using that framework. Um, it originally comes from Twitter. Um, very popular. Um, it's there was a Bootstrap theme developed last year um, that sort of fitted. The, this framework on top of Moodle as best as possible without changing core much. Um, and so what we've done is basically bring that into core, um, but we've brought it into core as a new base theme. So we, with the themes we have the base, um, uh, we used to always have a base and everything inherited from that generally. Um, and uh, there was a very plain one called standard, which was the default and many other themes that inherited from base. And developers generally, when they change something in Moodle, add something to Moodle Core, would add CSS and HTML to, um, to base. Well, now Bootstrap is a new base theme, and it uh, allows uh, this new base theme to have uh, some renderers to override bits of core that need overriding, um, so changing the HTML. Um, and in future, um, well, over time, and we've already started it, is that the, the core renderers, the, the default renderers in Moodle will be um, improved and extended so that that's not as necessary. Um, so that uh, Moodle will produce nicer and nicer HTML over time and um, bootstrap in mind without breaking other themes. Um, but the, so there's, there's going to be a new family of themes coming up now based on the bootstrap theme. And uh, that's the future. We'll, we'll maintain support for the old themes for, uh, I'm guessing, a, uh, a year or two, two years maybe um, from now. But um, it is going to be deprecated over time because uh, the old themes just are very hard to make work properly, responsibly, um, to, to theme all the bits, all the corners and buttons and forms just quite as easily as, as it is on the strap. So, um, Bootstraps the direction for now. So that's the general um, uh, approach. At the moment, the, the name of the Bootstrap core theme is actually about to change. It's still, it's, it's currently it's called Bootstrap. It's probably going to be called Bootstrap Base. And um, as well in Moodle 2.5, there will be one theme, kind of equivalent to standard as it used to be. This new theme will be the one that you can actually select in the interface. Um, Right now in Git, it's called Simple, but there already was a theme called Simple, so that name's going to have to change too very soon this week. Um, but this, this new theme is like a template theme. It doesn't really add any CSS to it itself. It, uh, it just implements Bootstrap as a parent and um, adds a few more settings. You can add a logo to the theme and a bit of random CSS uh, and a footer. Um, and that'll be a nice sort of default basic theme to have. Um, but if you want to make a new theme in Moodle now, a good start would be to take that theme and just clone it and change the name of it and start hacking away on it. So it's meant to be like a template theme that you can use to get started. And that's uh, an overview of themes. Um, is there any questions or would anyone else like to talk about it?
So Bass is answer, answering some questions in the dev chat about the, um, um, the grids. Yes, we're using bootstrap grids, but really uh, Bass. Do you want to talk on Gmail at all about it? Or Mary? If you look at the bug, you'll see the discussions going on and the, the various um, um, issues that are spun off from it. It's quite a complex issue overall, but I think we're just about there. Um, Gareth, probably I would say tomorrow, today, um, that we'll, we'll change the bootstrap base name. Um, Oh, so Rex has mentioned um, the uh, less issue. Um, so another thing that's new about the core the base bootstrap theme uh, is that it, uh, the CSS is written using something called less. You may be familiar with it. Um, it's a way of writing CSS in a, um, a more programmatic way. So you can define variables and um, you, you write your CSS that, that way, and then you need a program to compile it into ordinary CSS. Um, it's pretty simple, I think, once we get the hang of it, but we're all, we're all having to learn it. Um, but it, it does let us um, be more powerful with CSS. The, the themes based on Bootstrap don't have to use less. It's purely on a um, theme by theme basis. Um, but seeing as the core, the base theme uh, is so important, it's it's good to have a um, something more programmatic. Uh, Rex just mentioned it's like UE Shifter in terms of the new JavaScript stuff. Um, so someone else asked in the dev chat about the um, will the core renderers be rewritten to match Bootstrap, um, and Tim's got an answer there. Generally, um, no, we're not. We're not like making Moodle match Bootstrap, but if it makes sense to rewrite a core renderer to make it, uh, to add a class or make it consistent, um, because generally the HTML that Bootstrap wants is all very sensible and as, as simple as possible. Like it's hard to simplify it any further. So it tends to be sensible HTML anyway. Um, so where we can do it without breaking things or adding a class, we'll do it in core renderers. But if it's something very Bootstrap specific, then we'll do it in a render in the Bootstrap base class. Um, Mary asked, "Who's just out of the picture in the room?" Um, well, so this is Barbara and Damien and Jerome's over here, and Fred just out of the picture, leaning Fred. Uh, Michael Durard's down here. Okay. And Adrian Greaves up here, and David Monlau over right here. I don't think we can see you, but he's moving the camera. Um, ah, so Bass mentioned uh, boot swatches. Um, boot swatches are, are kind of like um, themes within themes, basically. It's like um, a lump of CSS you can throw on top of the Bootstrap theme. Is that would that be a fair thing to say, Bass? Um, and if you look up Boot Swatch, um, you can see a lot of people are, are making themes, Bootstrap type themes that way. Um, so Moodle themes could use them too. Ah, also variables and CSS. He's saying. Uh, Apu's saying, can a plugin that uses Bootstrap plus less be used with a theme that isn't based on Bootstrap? <laughs> plugin that I don't know, I, don't, I don't, can't parse that sentence. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean. Um, plugins don't use Bootstrap plus less. Okay, well, I'll leave that question. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can see the link on the um, dev chat. Uh, where is the link? Uh, so this issue here is the, was the main issue. 
um, but it's now um, a subtask of the, the bigger meta, and you can see the, uh, the various subtasks that have sprung out of this change, <laughs> and the many, many things. So, um, I, look, I'd say at this time it looks really good. There are still enough small problems that I wouldn't make Bootstrap the default theme of Moodle just yet. I would say 2.6 definitely, um, but right now it's probably still slightly experimental. Um, but certainly worth playing with and looking at, and um, uh, it's uh, a good thing. Uh, and if you haven't seen, no, I can't show you it because I haven't got a site here right this second. But I mean, the most awesome thing about it is its responsiveness. The way it folds down into an iPhone interface at small sizes and a tablet interface at sort of medium sizes. Uh, and works like you expect on a touch device. Uh, okay, let's uh, move on. Um, uh, so David Mudrak uh, is going to talk about the um, the new installation of plugins. So. Um, David and Apu both worked on this. David did most of the Moodle side of things. And take it away, David. Are you there? Hello. Hello, we can hear you. That's good. That's a good start. OK, I just shared my screen to demonstrate the thing a bit. So can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it, David. Okay, excellent. So, actually, this new feature is is a part of a bigger project. As uh, HQ likes to think of Moodle more as a platform or a framework for developing uh, features and things via plugins, then uh, it was decided, or uh, there was a bigger project to support this ecosystem of plugins more. And the first part of it was implemented in two point three where we started with checking for available updates. Then in 2.4, we added automatic updates deployment. And the new feature in 2.5 is then the administrators can install new add-ons, new plugins directly from Moodle administration interface without having to access FTP or, or, their, or their file system. So there is a new admin tool called add-on installer implement it and this new new tool is able to deploy a plugin from uploaded zip package or to fetch zip packages from moodle.org plugins uh, registry or directory directly and uh, deploy them. Uh, the web server apparently has to have right access to required locations to be able to deploy these packages and after the package is deployed standard upgrade procedure is, is going to happen. Let me demonstrate this, uh, this new feature uh, right now. So I will just, uh, I will just visit the new tool in, in site administration sections, which is located at site administration plugins install add-ons. At the tool screen, there are basically two sections. The first one with the big button is used to browse Moodle plugins directory and install plugins from there directly. The second part is uh, used for deploying or installing plugins from uploaded zip file. I will demonstrate uh, first installing, installing a plugin from Moodle plugins directory. So by clicking a button, what basically happens is that the browser is redirected to Moodle plugins directory where uh, I can search for for some plugins to install. Let's say I want to install some workshop module extension. So I can browse through them. And at, 
at this screen, I, I found a plugin that I want to install to my site. It's available for Moodle 2.5, so just by pressing the install button, I'm redirected back to my site with the information about the plugin to be uh, installed. Basically, this uh, this link contains uh, some basic information about the plugin. So now if I continue, the zip, the information, meta information about the zip and the zip itself will be downloaded for validation. Nothing in, uh, will be installed yet. So if I continue, uh, my Moodle site fetches the zip from, uh, from the repository, from the Moodle plugins directory and validates it. I'm sorry for my internet connectivity, it takes, takes a while apparently for unknown reason. Okay, the zip was fetched and validated correctly. There are a couple of criteria that uh, must pass before the before the plugin is uh, before the plugin is deployed. We can add more rules for this validation or throw some warnings if, let's say, malicious functions are used in the code, etc. And if I agree and continue with installing add-on, I'm just uh, the zip package is extracted into appropriate location and Moodle starts upgrading uh, upgrading to a new version containing the plugins as, as we know. So I can just upgrade Moodle database now and the plugins uh, plugin is installed pretty easily. It takes a couple of clicks and, and it's there. The other yeah. The other uh, functionality that is there can be used for installing plugins uh, from manually uploaded zip package. As we can see, as we can see at, at the next screen, or at, at the same screen, at the next section of, the, of this new tool, we can basically uh, upload any, any zip package uh, in the same format that is being uploaded to Moodle plugins directory. So let's say I have my zip package downloaded from Moodle plugins or even provided by some from some external source. I want to install activity module called stamp collection. I already prepared it in, in my private files, but it's basically the zip package that is that was downloaded from Moodle plugins directory or it can be fetched from GitHub or whatever. Okay, so I will use this file. I will check that I understand uh, all eventual consequences of installing add-ons to my site. And again, from now on, the procedure, uh, the procedure is still the same. The package is validated. If the validation passes, I can install the add-on as, as if I, manually deployed it on my uh, on my site while working on this couple of uh, couple of bits in in Moodle core and Moodle plugins management screens were improved as well so for example things like uninstalling plugins and and these things were improved a bit and we will continue working more on this on this overall code system of supporting plugins and, and Moodle core itself actually as the next stage of this bigger project I mentioned is to be able to update the whole Moodle from uh, just from admin interface as we know from WordPress for example. Okay so if there are any questions Uh, Jason, uh, does this support pulling in packages from a source other than Moodle org? At the moment, uh, you can, you, the admin has to uh, upload the zip manually as I demonstrated. The alternative is uh, sort of, uh, sort of hacking that you can actually, in config PHP file, you can, uh, 
you can set an alternative provider of uh, of packages, but uh, it's it's mainly used for testing only, as all the API communication and everything has to be has to be the same as as with the official server. And yes, this is the same proce process as with normal download, unzip, and upgrading module. Yeah, the project is pretty clever and it uh, does a lot of things. Uh, we reuse the validator that is used at Moodle plugins uh, site itself with a couple of, uh, ma making it a couple of more strict or extending some more checks. Uh, yes, if I uninstall a plugin, for example, this participation credit plugin, uh, what's new in is that uh, not only uh, not only the plugin is removed from the database, but as uh, the Moodle has right access to to these directories, it offers you to get rid of the of the files from the file system as well. So if I continue now, the plugin folder will be removed from the file system as well. And so I just installed and un uninstalled the plugin with with no uh, with no trace in the file system there is one thing to mention maybe as uh, developers are here uh, your Moodle site is not communicating directly with moodle.org slash plugins to, to save some performer to load of the main server but there is sort of proxy server called download moodle.org which uh, fetches information from the main database and distribute it, distributes it to, to all Moodle sites and because this proxy server is updated like every hour or so or so so at the moment if if you upload a new version to Moodle plugins directory it can take up to one hour before you are able to to install it this way we can improve it uh, we can improve it in the future a bit but uh, there is this uh, this small lack at the moment yet uh, reading other other uh, other questions here uh, no there is no way to roll back any, any updates at the moment because Moodle itself is does not any automatic backups of or snapshots of the date of the database and uh, Moodle data directory so it's still administrators responsibility to have these backups prepared just in case something goes wrong uh, these validation functions they do things like checking if version PHP is correct if version PHP file correctly declares or required information if the plugin name matches the plugin type of uh, of what admin uh, chose and and other other aspects Uh, thanks, David. Uh, I think we've got most of the questions there. One one thing we were thinking about for the future was to uh, even automate the connection from GitHub to Moodle plugins, so that uh, possibly trusted developers could um, uh, tag their plugin appropriately, um, and that Moodle.org could automatically pick that up and update the plugins in the, in the database. Um, that's going to take, that'll be the next stage and it'll take some thinking. But I mean it would be kind of cool to be sitting there on your computer, finish development, you're sure about it, you hit send, push it to GitHub and um, all around the world everyone on their Moodle sites, all the admins get a little note saying there's a new update available of this plugin. Um, but uh, there's a lot of issues to work through there. Um, it would be nice to have a rollback or something. Maybe you could do that on a cloud system. But, um, but David, thanks for all the work on that. It's, it, I think this kind of really uh, finishes off the, the feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Apu's uh, getting the, uh, has got the install buttons on 
good at the orb now, and uh, it'll only be improving. So, um, okay. Anything else you want to say, David? Uh, no, thanks. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so, uh, next up, we have. Uh, now, the, the short form stuff, um, so if you've looked at Moodle 2.5 lately, um, you may be familiar with the short forms. Um, Ruslan, we didn't, didn't really get to talk to you before, but do you, you did most of the original development on all that. Do you want to talk about it at all, or is it pretty self-explanatory? Um, Hopefully you're hearing me. No, maybe not. Um, okay, well, yes, so, I'm sorry, Russ. We didn't really get in touch with you. Um, um, I kind of threw your name up there just in case you wanted to talk about something. But um, anyway, it's a, it's a fantastic thing for the interface, I think. Um, so I can demo it. Uh, can I demo it? Let me find a site that's nearby. Yeah? All right. Go for it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'll be better. Cool. Oh, thanks, Damien. Um, so, I like the subject of this website. Um, so, basically, uh, it's on anywhere there's big forms. You'll see it. And not this one. Why not this one? Oh, this is a bit old. Oh, look, I'm thinking of the it's things. Old. It's not general. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so okay. There is an update to this particular it's form. In, it's in integration. It's really integration. But basically, the big forms are all broken into sections, uh, and uh, well, they already were into sections, but now they can collapse. And basically, that's the feature. There's an expand all button to see that collapse all button. But by default, it only shows uh, the. I'm trying to pronounce the word for this. <laughs> I'm going to make a blank. What the section is called? Field yeah. sets. The field so sets. The sets. and the field set. Yeah, it shows field sets that contain required fields by default. Or anything validation, um, or anything that has been set in code to open by default. Yeah. But. While we're working on them, we're trying to put the required fields at the top, really. So it shouldn't open any other section in general. That is what we're trying to do. This one will be So here's a quiz. See, it's only opening the first one and it lets you drill into the things as you need them. Um, also seeing the bootstrap theme in action at the same time. Um, so that's that's basically it. Um, did you want to say anything about the... Um, the Simon is one an interesting one. Oh, yeah, oh, that's got your patch on this one. Okay. Oh, yeah? Yeah. OK. It's pretty slow. I don't really have anything to say about it. But well, uh, well, probably one thing is that it's going to affect all forms all the time by default. So that's in all your plugins as well. Uh, what's so, interesting here? Well, I didn't have to change anything. Everything would have still worked, but um, with the short forms, it does um, change the way that you look at the forms a little bit, and really pushing all the most important fields up the top of the form. Um, I've reorganized the um, assignment settings page so that uh, you get these three sections open by default, and everything else is hidden. Um, and change the order of things just to uh, try and 
make it really simple when you open the first time and just show all the important fields and then be complicated, just deny. Exactly. So, yeah, the, it's just to um, eliminate that sticker shock that people get when they first open up Moodle and they get this thick form in the face. Um, so, I think overall it's a good thing. But you should check your own forms in your own code uh, to make sure they make sense because some forms kind of assume that everything's going to be displayed and don't quite look right. And so, um, that's the case. What's the code you do on the. Um, Set expanded. Set, set expanded on that yeah, particular. The main problem is that we didn't really uh, spend time thinking about the names of the field sets themselves. So you could have miscellaneous and you don't have no idea what it means. So you have to expand it, and that's where you probably want to reword your things. Yes. That's what we're doing in court, right? So um, I think that's that's that. Uh, I'll uh, let's finish on forms, and then we'll talk about the editor, because I can see people want to talk about that editor. Um, OK. Um, well, so the editor, um, so this is a, a new thing that can be enabled uh, on a per instance basis. Um, there is a new thing I should have mentioned before. We, we now have the concept of a policy bug. So if there's any development that gets held up by a policy needing to be decided, then um, there is a new component in the tracker called policy. And one of the first ones is actually about this. Um, it's the policy of should we make all editors in forms uh, be collapsed by default? Um, so if you're interested in that, go look in the policy component in the tracker. Uh, Pretty cool, and, and it all works. So um, you know, should all the elements look like that? Thanks, Dan, for the link. I'll show it to the video people as well. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> um, well, that's what you need some editing for. So make it big. Um, okay. Ah, yeah, Tim says to thank Colin Chambers for the collapsed editor. I didn't realize Colin had done that, so thanks, Colin. Okay. Um, we should probably move on uh, so we don't go too long. So, next up. Um, uh, right, and thanks to Rosalind again for doing the, the bulk of the work on that. Um, and going through a bunch of iterations in the beginning that you don't even see. Um, Rosalind, is there anything else you want to say? On chat, I can relay it. Yeah, I'm going to okay. You need to um, well, I'll pass it on if you say anything there. Um, Marina, um, are you going to talk a little bit about the course listing stuff? And I probably need to add you to this chat. Yeah. So let me just do that. Um, I thought I did it before, actually. Uh, which are oh, yeah. So, Marina, are you getting some email or something? Can you get into the Hangout? <laughs> Can you just type? Um, well, no. <laughs> It'd be cool if you could show us something. But I can also just do the demo here if you like while you talk about it. Only one course here. 
Um, so you'll see on the front page settings. Ah, okay. No, it's not okay. Oh, All right. Well, we we've got some screenshots here. Ah, uh, rats. Go there. <laughs> the Firefox. Why is it Firefox? So to save lots of reconfiguring to see different things, this is as good as any. So, um, so let's I'll talk for you, Marina. Then, um, so all the course listings now are rendered. They go through a renderer, and they're used consistently. So everywhere where we list courses on the page, it's all done the same way. All the, um, so it's good for styling, um, and there's more options as well, and things have been cleaned up. Somewhat. So um, here's a little site with two courses. Um, course files. Right. And so this page, this course here has um, what we uh, call course summary files. Um, you can add uh, images, and the images are shown actually on the page. But if you add things like PDFs, then they become clickable links. Um, so you could have, you know, some description of the course, a longer description of the course for people to download and look at um, before they actually enter or pay for it or something. Uh, here's a a page with a um, um, lots and lots of courses and categories, and you can see them all nested and collapsible. One. And there they are collapsed. I assume Marine's tested it with 10,000 courses, Tim. It reverts to a search box uh, when you go over a course limit, and that setting can be set in the editing. Yeah. Yeah. We had that before, I think. Before it was hard coded to 200, now it's a setting. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Spread. So, um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, you get the idea. Um, so depending on the size of the course, how many thousands or, or a couple of courses it has, you can adjust the front page to display them in the best possible way. And they should work on all things properly and style nicely. Um, the important thing to mention, though, is that it has changed from before. So. Um, if you've done anything funky with CSS and HTML, well, with CSS around the course listings in your theme, it could break on 2.5. Um, however, if you've just inherited from a base theme and you haven't touched that bit too much, you should be fine. Is that fair summary, Marina? And Marina is, has written a document documenting all the changes. Yeah. To from here, there. Um, so that's linked to from the release notes, and it's probably the the most breaky thing we have in two five. Is this? Um, it's a very nice doc too. She's got side by side comparisons down here of different code, um, and it's pretty clear, I think. So it's good docs. Thanks, Marina. Because I know uh, that work touched so many messy, very old areas of Moodle, um, which Marina seems to be a specialist at. Um, so that was a lot more work than it probably looks like. Um, and that's the basics of that one. Is there anything else to mention, Marina? No? OK. You haven't given up on chat? <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's move on to the B. Thank you, Marina, though, for all that. Um, 
Uh, Marina's saying um, it was not possible to keep the old CSS, and that's true. We don't take breakage lightly. I mean, it's, uh, it had to be done um, because it wasn't consistent between the different course listings. So to make them consistent, we had to create stuff. Um, but that, that won't happen again, I assume. Uh, Andrew mentions that there is some new JavaScript loading on the category listings for very large listings. I assume you can uh, load as you're drilling down on a collapsed listing, you can load them with Ajax. It hasn't landed yet, uh, and I don't know the status of it. But, um, okay. Um, No, oh, maybe there is a bit of lag, actually. Dan, I didn't think of that. That's why. OK. The next uh, thing is to uh, look at the BHAT test. So David's going to talk about those. And it's over to, have we lost him again? Are you ready? No. No? The microphone doesn't work. Can I go after a couple of seconds? Yeah, OK, we'll skip you and we'll come back. Uh, microphone problem. Um, so, Peta, are you there? Uh, can you jump on early and save the day, talk about jQuery stuff? So, hello, everybody. I'm not going to talk for long. It's just a little reminder that we have now jQuery as part of the standard installation. It's not intended for standard Moodle features. It is designed only for people that are coming to Moodle. They are starting with development. They don't know UI, but they understand jQuery pretty well. It's for them. It's not for us. So please don't submit any pull requests with jQuery in it. And what does it solve? It helps, especially if you have multiple plugins that are using jQuery. We are distributing one stable version with each major Moodle release. We are going to upgrade it for Moodle 2.6, 2.7. And there is included the basic jQuery library, then the jQuery user interface uh, plugins, and a migration plugin for older jQuery versions. So if you have something written for jQuery 1.7, you need to include the migrate plugin so that it works with the current jQuery version we have in Moodle. Uh, I do not expect that we would be importing jQuery 2.0 something or what's the latest release. We'll be sticking with the one that is compatible with Internet Explorer 1.789. Uh, oh, oh, it's not 1. Point, it's 6.7.9, sorry. So if you want any information, just go to the developer docs, and there is one page called jQuery. It's here. I tried to describe it with examples so that especially new developers understand how to use it. And there is one FHQ at the end which should hopefully explain everything or answer all your questions. So here it is. Don't use it. And if there is a new developer who insists on jQuery, it's for them. That's all. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you. Um, Any questions? We can't see you. We just see a silhouette. Um, any questions? I suppose we can talk about jQuery 2. Point anything in like two years, because I suppose that we will be somehow supporting Moodle, the Internet Explorer 8 for at least two more releases. It will not be officially supported, but we are not going to remove all the support we have there.
Any more non-internet explorer questions? I hate Internet Explorer. <laughs> We've been saying that for so long, uh, but it almost has no meaning anymore. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. It's like, been saying that for 10 years. Um, uh, but of course, if you really want the latest jQuery, there is a feature where you can override the built-in jQuery with anything else. So in theory, your plugin could supply jQuery too, and all the other plugins would be forced to use it too. So it should work in uh, sane internet browsers, but well, it's possible if you want it. Um, I was just about to say, actually, while you're there, um, that David needs two more minutes. Could, could you talk about UE changes, UE shift, or does uh, Andrew want to? Or? Well, I don't know much about this. It's just the post-processing of the Moodle JavaScript files. And the aim is to use similar processes the UI team is using. So instead of just compressing it on the fly, we are now relying on external tools. And uh, it's adding some metadata because UI itself is written in one file and then it's compiled into the debug file, standard file, and well, the developer file. So it's not really important, I suppose. Just you just learn to run the tools after you finish making changes and it's done. It, it didn't change in any way from the from the PHP side, it's just the change when you are writing the JavaScript itself. Okay. Um, I was trying to add you there, Andrew. Yes. We will be able to use a lot more tools from the upstream for documentation, testing, and everything. So it's a move a bit more towards UI coding style from our old Moodle coding style. And those are not big changes, and the benefits are relatively big. So I hope it's worth it. And now that the beginners are will be, will be probably using jQuery more, so the core team should be using more advanced teams. And if you look at the Bootstrap team and everything, you will be using the command line during development a lot more because you need to compile this, build that, compress this thing. So it's just a trend towards a bit different development. OK. Um, anything you want to add, Andrew? Throw you in the deep end? You're on. You're on the air. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, the only other things we need to add, though, um, hopefully by I think Pedro covered most of it, but uh, with moving to Shifter and getting the minified files, it means that we can start adding uh, documentation to our JavaScript um, and stuff like that. So we'll be able to produce some great um, documentation, rather like the UE API docs. Um, in fact, I've already got some stuff um, started in proof of concept for that. Uh, we can also start writing uh, unit, te unit tests for the JavaScript that we have in core for things like the, uh, the new help pop-ups are based on uh, something called the tooltip. Um, and anyone can use that tooltip anywhere within Moodle. Uh, the same goes for all of the dialogues, um, so the notification and that kind of stuff. Um, we'll be writing uh, various uh, unit tests for that, and we can hopefully start adding some performance tests as well to the JavaScript. Um, and again, it's something I've had a, a quick look at already. Uh, it, will, it will let us work out which bits are making our JavaScript slower, um, which is always a good thing, and that will hopefully help us to improve the performance um, across Moodle. Uh, one of the other things with using Shifter is that it adds, um, we've started passing all of our JavaScript, that, well, all of our shifted JavaScript through JS hint which is like a JS lint, but a little, more, a little bit more configurable and catches a few more things. Um, and one of the things that will do will hopefully mean that we can improve our uh, 
compatibility compatibility for uh, older versions of Internet Explorer, which was one of the biggest issues with IE7 and IE8 and other versions, is that they don't handle uh, things like trailing commas in arrays um, and uh, automatic semicolon insertion very well. So we'll be rejecting any code which doesn't pass through the linting properly um, in the future. Um, and hopefully that will mean that we pick up issues which would affect Internet Explorer um, much more easily and also other browsers. So um, that's most of the bits and pieces. Um, we've also made some changes to the way that we do debugging. You can use, um, uh, so, uh, instead of using console.log in your JavaScript, you, need, you can use y.log um, on from the YUI library. Um, and that basically lets you do things like all the console logging um, and there's y.error and a few other bits and pieces. Um, but you can, th those are automatically filtered out of the production code so that you only get those when you have JS, the JS rev set to minus one for doing JS development. So you can add various useful bits of um, debugging, which I think Tim Hunt was using recently uh, for doing some of the auto, quiz auto saving. So he might have some thoughts on that one already. Um, and so kind of lots of things like that, um, just to try and make the, the way that we're using and distributing JavaScript to Moodle just that bit easier. Um, it does, however, obviously add a step because now, rather than just submitting JavaScript, you need to build it and make some changes to the way that we structure it. So there's a slightly different file structure. Um, and then you need to run it through a tool, uh, which is called Shifter. Um, but that's relatively easy to install um, and to run. So hopefully, that's good. Um, I think that's everything I have anyway. Any other questions? Um, let's have a look at Thanks, Andrew. That was uh, a lot of dense information. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I think my the, a, a lot of people were focusing on your hair <laughs> in the, in the yeah. chat. So apparently some people are weak at the knees, so that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> Job and hair. And hair. Um, so, no, that's, that's really cool. Um, there is some really good docs about it that you've written on Moodle Docs. Um, yeah, I'll post the links to those in the dev chat for you. Yeah. Uh, maybe add them to the dev. Well, they'll be in the notes. Or, no, add them to the dev page. The one we were showing before. Uh, yep, yeah, sure. Yep, yeah, sure. Cool. Getting some questions about your shampoo now. <laughs> um, oh. okay. Cool. Thanks. Um, well, uh, so that, anyway, the good thing is that um, uh, that we made you blush across the world, and uh, the second thing is that um, that the JavaScript has this good framework now for um, hopefully improving the quality of it a lot over time and making development faster, so it's super cool. Um, so uh, next thing, if you don't mind, we'll move on to, uh, is David uh, yeah. here? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if the microphone will work, but I can show a couple of links and then I move there and we try with the microphone, otherwise I uh, I can share the screen. So okay. Um, at least we will, you will see how it works. All right, so let me share the, the screen here. So uh, David is uh, focusing on testing, he's a test engineer, and uh, talk to us about VHAT. Um, I need the mouse. Click down here. What? Now we are sharing this, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know how much of you know what is. It's just a a frame a testing framework to to run functional tests. This is the main uh, the main website and uh, is oriented in behavior driven development. So. Instead of unit testing, you are supposed to write things like this feature. You describe the feature you you are testing, and then a list of steps to describe the the expected behavior. So uh, we can say, given I am logged in as admin and I access um, course one, I should see activity one. <coughs> if there is some regression. Uh, we will detect it with this because the test will fail. So what we have done is integrate this beautiful framework that 
manages the dependency with Composer inside Moodle. So each plugin can uh, each plugin can define uh, its own feature files and also what the these steps that are PHP code. So for example, we can have a um, I follow XXX link and then the hat will uh, walk through the DOM of the page looking for a link, an A tag called with the text that you add in the placeholder. So uh, an example of what we currently have more or less is this. We have the feature login with a quick description of what this is supposed to do and a scenario that are like the test cases of, of a unit test. All, all these behavior driven development things are split in uh, three parts given where we set up the context, like can be the setup of PHP unit, when that represents the action we perform, and then where we assert against the outputs we see. For example, I am on login index, I fill a couple of typical fields, and I press the login button. Then I should see this course, because this is an existing user. Otherwise, we try with an, an existing user, and we are not supposed to see it. Well, this is an example that I think that is not very correct. But anyway, this is what is supposed to to look like uh, one of those files. It's just more or less human readable. So at some point, uh, not only developers can write this test, this test like happens with PHP unit, which is very good. And uh, we have all this documentation here, splitting writing these features. It's a bit long. But but it's, uh, well, it's a, it's a new thing. So like any new thing at the, uh, at the beginning, there is a lot of information to get, but then it's more easy. Right now, I, I've been, these last weeks, I've been writing lots of tests per day. So when you get used to it, it's not that hard. And then there's the other part that is adding state definitions. Is like this example, I add a forum post with blah, 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 as a description. So we, write a regular expression, I add a forum post with a placeholder in here as a description. This is a, a PHP, um, it's an annotation in the PHP doc. So hat what does is gets this kind of regular expressions and uh, the steps that matches a regular expression runs them, runs the PHP continued on them. And this PHP, what does is interact with a Selenium instance or goods or, well, there are different drivers, but these kind of drivers um, are uh, sending requests to web servers and they interact like a real user is supposed to do. All this is um, better explained in all this long file. And what could be useful, because it's a lot of information, at the same time, it's a quick start. So you have the quick steps you have to follow to set up this. It's more or less like PHP unit, a prefix because it uses a, an alternative uh, test environment with the prefix and data root, how to install the dependencies, or what is like install the PR PHP unit or the PHP unit dependencies. And then usually you want to run the test on Selenium because it's what usually people, um, users do. They interact with uh, Firefox, Internet Explorer, or whatever. So you need to install this, and you just run it. It's a, it's a jar, a Java jar. And with this open, you are, we are sending petitions to local hosts to the port 4444. And uh, this opens an instance of Firefox, so the browser you specify on your config. And uh, it begins to perform Mm, actions like can be click in here, check that in the DOM we find this. 
I don't know if right now go to step definition. Ah. Uh, But basically, you will not understand anything because it's PHP, but it's calling uh, all the hat methods. I guess that for the name of the methods, you can guess what it means. This one, for example, I log in as a username. So what it does is the example we saw before, and this one is calling different other steps definitions. I fill the form, I, I fill this form, so it looks at the DOM for this field, and it fills it with this bar. The bar, that is the only argument of this step. So in here you will write, I log in as admin, admin between quotes. When it's between quotes, it's a bar, so it's get as an argument by the function, and it's the one we are passing to other uh, steps and to see another step definition that maybe helps you more to understand it. This the general file will. All these basic things are here. Um, click link. Find link. So this means that the hub is interacting all the time with Selenium. We have the DOM of the page we are looking in. And it just parses the DOM, looks for uh, an XPath matching a link with the submitted text. And then the action is to click on it. There are all sorts of actions we can do. Interact with buttons, click links, and the work we have been doing is to provide these step definitions so other developers, third writers, um, third parties, whatever people that want can use them to write their own test. We know that the set of step definitions is big enough to write tests because we have written more or less a hundred of the, we have automated more or less a hundred of the MDL QA tests. So of course that you will miss things because I miss them too. But uh, it's, a, it's a big, uh, a good start, I think. And uh, in fact, I'm happy to see that open badges came with a few behind things, including the blood of files, which was a bit tricky because if you are running the Selenium instance in a remote server, you cannot block files because they are not in the local server, so it's a bit tricky. But anyway, it's good to see that things begin to come, new features begin to come with, Can you show with the, Selenium test. The link that uh, Dan, the, the, the inside Moodle 2.5, is that a page that shows all the definitions? Ah, yes. Um, yes, yes. Uh, one uh, of those tabs had a 2.5 site. So this is acceptance test site. This is a regular Moodle site, but it's using the test environment. And uh, it doesn't matter because for it has the same features a normal site has, but empty. It's completely empty. What we provide for the writers to write tests easily is this interface, this site administration, development, acceptance testing. Well, this is only, uh, you can only see this if you previously installed the, the dependencies of BHAT and all this, because we require um, the BHAT framework to parse all the files we have spread al along uh, model uh, code base. And this is the list of the current step definitions with a quick description, so you can know more or less for what they are. I add a comment to comments block. 
well, it are, there are, uh, this is all mixed, it's not filtered. So in here you can have the, um, the component, even if you are going to automate something related with blocks, you can check in Moodle blocks what kind of steps can you find to help you do something related with it. In this case, it's only I add the block name string block. This is commented all in the, in the documentation. It's at the end, it's only information for the writers. It's all, or, all oriented for users that are not developers, non, non nerds like us. And the and part of the string I learned, part of the text is what kind of param it expects. I, I'm explaining this quickly now, but it's all in the documentation. Most of the time, what we will be using is general, because in here there is a lot of general things like clicking buttons, I don't know, is in is in form. Well in this is yes, this one click in here, a click in here. And click is a bit tricky because you can click everywhere. So if you have two links with users, you are uh, in trouble. Then we can have other step definitions like this one to say I click on um, uh, edit edit link in the uh, LDAP table row. So in the plugins and here for example settings. If you want to click in settings, well uh, Selenium is not as smart as we are and he don't know where he's supposed to click and most of the time clicks in the first one. This, oh. All the, all the other I click on are trying to restrict where you want to click to parts of the DOM. You can specify it with CSS selectors, with textpad selectors, or to provide a more human language thing I don't know where they are. It's the like this one we saw. I click in uh, whatever in the table row. Then it looks for a table row with that text on it, or whatever in the activity, and it looks in a in the course page in one activity. Uh, well, uh, the first time you are writing a test, more or less, is keep trying because you will see that, oh, this link doesn't match. You have to see the Selenium instance that you're running to see where is the mistake. You will, we have also tried hard to provide uh, good exceptions. So if you are beginning writing tests, you can know where is the problem and you can try to find it quickly. Otherwise you can get lost trying to know what's wrong. And then maybe, Better than see all that, I can try to show you, show one test running. Uh, my microphone, it seems that it's not working or it's not set up properly. So maybe you can not hear me, but... Okay, we'll, we'll just commentate from here. Oh, okay, I will try. Yeah, do you want to run it? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. No, no. Um, yes, yes. If, well, I don't know if I can reply, if there are questions, if I can reply later or now. Because maybe it's empty. Oh, yes? Start running the test and what well what's running you come back here, no? Yes, it will. Yeah. Okay. I I will not run anymore on the actual off there. Okay. We have to do So yeah, it's pretty cool to see these tests running, so it'd be good if we can get that. Not seeing anything yet, David? Screen. I think 
Um, so the, uh, as you can see with the blank screen, it's incredibly <laughs> uh, easy to test. Um, uh, he's gone. Look, oh, he's back. Okay, holding our breath. Will he or won't he? Minimalist. Oh, well identified, Aloy. Um, Oh, you saw it too? Oh, we didn't see it. Oh, maybe it's just us. Can you guys see? We can't, but others can, I think. Can you see him now? It's going to be a slight delay. But... Okay, well, some people are seeing it. We can't. We can all walk in there. Yeah, we we have clicked on his window, but uh, we just seen pure white. He's gone. All right. Well, um, <laughs> we're not. I don't think it's working. You're restarting what? The machine? Hang up. Hang up. Oh. Oh. You will have now. All right. Is it working? Okay, they can see you. They can see you. We can't, but they can. I'm sure it's good. So it's just like using Moodle normally, but sped up. And nobody's running the mouse. They can. They can. You can. We can't. Oh, okay. Oh, you can't. No. We did. Well, uh, and maybe, it'll, maybe it'll be gone out on YouTube. As long as it's working. So, uh, well, so they're seeing the test running on the I on hope. The I hope somebody is seeing it. Right now, I open a client and I run the command that you can find it in the in the documentation, and uh, it. With the Selenium instance running, you know, it automatically starts a Firefox instead of full browser, start a, Fox, a Firefox instance, and uh, Firefox begins to run like a user does. So you can see the, the cursor moving around the screen and clicking on links and following around the following clicks or presses buttons around Moodle phrases. And during these clicks, we are asserting against the DOM contents to ensure that we can find what, what we want to find. This is the kind of test we can do with this. We cannot have smart eyes and check that the CSS looks good. It, we can try, but it's a lot of, of, of time to do it, and it's really hard. And probably we cannot do anything good at the end. But to ensure that there are no regressions, that the elements are where they are supposed to be, that the tests are working, is enough. Yeah. Cool. There are, I think that's we've got enough. It's coming through. I hope that they are seeing it also. <laughs> and so, well, the, the nice thing is with this um, that uh, people who, well, two things. If you write a plugin and you have tests, then you can have your own plugin tested. Sure, and, sure. And secondly, uh, you, you can uh, run it on your own site if it's heavily modified, and and test every change to make sure that you haven't broken mm -hmm. something yourself. Yes, maybe it also helps with the upgrades to other model versions because usually, well, you create a big diff, you apply the big diff to another site with the last version of Moodle, maybe it fails, you J don't detect the conflict. Jason's asking, can you just run tests for one plugin? Sure, it's, it's all tagged. So when you create a test, if, if you read the documentation, the first thing to do is to, to tag the test. You have to uh, add if it's a module mod, if it's a module assignment mod assignment, and then you can also add whatever you want. If it's something not in core, you can uh, add crazy things there. 
You don't need to be very politically correct. And, and, and just run one test. So. Uh, <clears throat> Justin Philip yep. is asking if this takes a screenshots. Marina came with the idea because she needed to to have a screenshots of one one uh, one set of steps to ensure that it was working properly in all the in all the browsers. But of course, you cannot assert if it looks good. So it, she thought of uh, having a screenshots after each step, and we added another new uh, new step to switch the theme. So combining both of them, Marina created a new administration tool that is is in his GitHub account. I don't know if you can find the link or, or not. And it what it does is basically this. So you run the test, you specify a set of steps, and it runs all these steps in all the themes or the themes you specify and and having a, saving a screenshot after each step. I don't know if this answers. Um, Rick's asked how many environments so we. Uh, right now we are working on this, on running the environment, on running on uh, Internet Explorer 8, 9, Safari in Mac, and uh, Chrome and Firefox in, in Linux. We are using a, a, a cloud-based service to do that. And this test will be running in the CI server and uh, passing every week. And if somebody breaks it, they will have to patch it. Source labs, source labs. For for open source projects, they have free accounts, but well, they, they provide the, the Selenium infrastructure for everything. All the I think I think they have eighty six combinations of browsers and operating systems, including Android and iPad and iPhone. But of course, all is through emulators. So depends on what do you want to test. It can be a bit tricky. Cool. Well, I think that's covered it all. Um, and it's a very, very cool system that's been built there. I don't, don't, I've never seen anything like it on any other project, really. Not, not, not that detailed. Um, so check it out. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, that's just awesome. And uh, uh, move on because I'm conscious of the time coming up for two hours. Um, so, Damien, um, you want to talk a bit about the assignment changes? Let's share the screen. Yeah. And hello. Oh, no, maybe it is cracking up. Oh, that's good. Maybe you just needed to come. I'm oh, just hearing that one. Oh, oh, that was that. There we go. Uh, I might just get rid of this one. <laughs> Or maybe we can recommend everyone to give it a try because it's more or less easy and uh, it's cool to see how they run. Absolutely. Uh, uh, okay, so what yours? Yeah, so um, I just wanted to quickly talk about what's uh, changed since 2.4 in the assignment module um, and then at the end, I'll touch on uh, what didn't quite make it in 2.5 for the assignment module. Um, so the first thing that I did is went through and made sure that all of the assignment code passed as code checking out. So if you're doing new development for anything for the assignment module, um, you have to run your code through code checker. Uh, so I'll be checking that as part of the peer reviews. Uh, second thing is that there's a whole lot more unit tests as part of the assignment, um, and those are also going to be required for all new features in the assignment module. Um, there are, it is getting more complicated with all the features that are in there, like um, group assignments and line marking and things like that. So um, the unit tests should pick up if you've accidentally broken anything um, in a lot of cases. Uh, and they're actually a really good um, 
way to write new features is to actually write the unit tests first um, and then add a little bit and then um, make sure that the unit te test passes and then uh, write the next bit. And that way you can build out the, um, the feature and make sure that all the tests pass all the way along. Uh, yes, there is a pending backboard issue for 2.4 assignment tests, um, which is pretty much this same set of tests minus a couple. Um, so it would be good to get them in stable on uh, 2.4 as well. Or it's just trying to ignore you, actually. <laughs> well, they're sitting there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the major feature for 2.5 is this submission attempt history. So these slides won't go for very long, and I'll bring up a, a demo slide. Um, uh, but I just wanted to give thanks to Davo Smith and Fernando, um, who uh, kicked off this work. Davo did the um, first version and send it through. Um, and Fernando funded that work as well. Uh, so thanks to them. Um, you've already seen a little bit earlier the cleanup of the assignment settings UI, but that was one of the other things that has changed. And uh, the other thing is that I finally managed to update the developer docs for writing assignment submission and feedback plugins. So uh, uh, I'm glad I've done that now. And the list of things which didn't make it for 2.5 um, is uh, there is a, a ticket there with a whole bunch of web services which covers submitting assignments and setting things to um, uh, blind marking and grading students and things like that. So basically anything that's in the assignment is covered in those web services, but they didn't make it for 2.5. Um, marking workflow is something that's already been submitted um, from Dan Marston, um, and that's a really cool feature. Um, and depending how much time it is, I've got that on a demo site, which I can show you now, uh, but it's not in 2.5, it'll be in 2.6. Um, and then we are talking about um, the best way to build some concept of um, a grading interface which is more unified across the activities. So there's a lot of these grading features which are going into assignment and it would be good to be able to get them into other activities as well. Um, but we're still specif writing specifications and working out what we're going to do exactly. So, in my site. Is this one? So I'm just going to show you the um, assignment submission history. So how it works is when you add a new assignment, in the settings for the assignment, uh, in settings. Um, you have these two new options here, which is um, attempts reopened, and there's a few different options there. So you can um, never reopen assignment attempts, um, which is the old behavior, and that's the default. Um, you can manually open um, a reopen attempts for a student, or you can automatically reopen attempts. So the difference between the last two is manually the teacher has to reopen a, an assignment attempt um, and automatically just means that the student can keep adding new attempts until they reach the grade to pass, which is in the grade book. Um, and you can also set a maximum number of attempts. So you can say that the teacher can reopen attempts for a student uh, until they get to four attempts and then they can't reopen it. Now, what this actually means, by logging as a teacher, <coughs> I 
mentioning the garrison full of Herberts is quite scary. Yeah, those are Fred's names, so you blame him. <laughs> You're from and South, DK. South Park. So um, this student has submitted an assignment, and everything looks the same except now you can see what attempt number um, we're currently looking at when we're grading it. Uh, this is the submission that the this is the latest submission from the student. Uh, but down here, under the normal settings, um, we can say whether, when we're grading it, we can uh, allow the student another attempt or uh, not allow them another attempt. And uh, right down the bottom, we can see a list of the previous attempts to the assignment and any feedback that was attached to those previous attempts. So basically, um, what happened before is a student would make their submission, and then the teacher would give them feedback, and then they would edit their submission um, and resubmit it. And the teacher would have no way to go back and see what their first submission was and what had changed between the two submissions. But now, basically, as you the student adds more attempts and the teacher gives them feedback, they get this long list of attempts, um, which shows at the bottom for both teachers and students so that they can see what's happened over time. So. So when a student goes to their submission, if it's been reopened, um, they have the option of adding a new attempt based on their previous submission or just adding a new attempt. The difference between those two is whether um, all the files and all the content that they've provided for the first attempt is copied to the new submission. Um, so uh, the other thing that they can see down here is the student sees the same list of previous attempts that the, the teacher can see. So this was the that was the last one that we did. And so that's copied their previous attempt uh, and they can just make some changes and submit it. So that, why is that concept hanging out of the editor's like that? That's um, a bootstrap. Bootstrap doing that. New bootstrap vibe. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks a lot, David. That's uh, that's awesome. This uh, module's really powering along. Uh, any thoughts or questions from anyone uh, about that? There's um, a lot of big requests coming landing in assignment the last six months. Yeah. People are. Yeah, this one had lots of votes. It was about 50 votes. Lots of votes. Okay, well, uh, let's get on to Paul Juan, I think, who's uh, languishing there in Spain. Juan, are you awake? Yes. Oh, excellent. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> we... Um, uh, well, it'd be great if you could talk a bit about the mobile app and what's been happening over the last few months with the team and um, um, where things are. We haven't really officially announced it properly yet on Moodle.org, but we will this week, I would say, any day. So go, go for it. Okay. Um... Well, 
Did you see my screen? Yes. Yes? Uh, can you see it on YouTube? Because we're having some issue here and we can't see it ourselves. But, um, okay. Great. Yes, okay. it's going through. Okay, okay. Well, um, as Martin said, I'm going to talk about the new official Moodle mobile app for, for Moodle that is called Moodle Mobile. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, my name is Juan Leiva, and I work as a consultant and a developer in CBA Consulting, that is the Moodle partner based in Barcelona. I am also an AdWords developer. You may know configura configurable reports on the LTA provider plugin. Um, well, uh, Moodle Mobile is an Android and also an iOS application that works in both phones and tablets. Um, the first version has the same features that the previous uh, my Moodle application that was available only for 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 iOS and for Moodle 2.2. Well, from Moodle 2.1 to Moodle point four. Um, the main difference are that. This uh, this new application is an HTML5 application and, and that requires Moodle 2.4. You can download the application from the Android Play Store or Apple App Market. Yes, you have to just search for Moodle Mobile. And the plan is to release a new version of the App every two months, including bug fixes and new features. And we, we are going to integrate also code contributed by the community. And this app should be used in combination with mo a mobile theme, like Bootstrap, for getting a, a full mobile experience. Um, the current version of the app is uh, 1.2. And the next version will be uh, uh, available in June, and 1.4 will be released in August and including uh, support for push notifications that I think will be the, the cool feature, the cool, very cool feature of, of this application. Um, my plan is that every time a Moodle major version is released, uh, I will try to include uh, functionalities that relies on new web services added in, in, in Moodle Core. Uh, the app is mainly a web service client, and so we we have to use, of course, Moodle Moodle Core web services. Um, the main technical features are that the 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 new application support plugins. You can create your own customizations, and you can override the application API. Uh, some app specs can be configured remotely in your Moodle site. Uh, you can translate the application in your Moodle installation um, using just uh, a, a custom uh, Moodle.php file. And you can also customize the style. You need to have, you, there is a new setting in, in the mobile, in plugins web services mobile where you can you can add a valid uh, CSS file containing your your custom styles. Um, we are using some technologies that are well known by the, by any JavaScript developer, like uh, well PhoneGap. We are using PhoneGap, PhoneGap for for cross compiling the application to native code to iOS and Android. Uh, well, we are using jQuery, jQuery and some jQuery plugins like jQuery, jQuery's user interface and touch swipe. Initially, we, we were thinking in using jQuery mobile, but finally we found that was an overkill, so we, we, we just use plain HTML5. And JavaScript. We are we are using also Beckmon, that is uh, that 
is very no, well known JavaScript library that uh, that we use for models, we use for controllers, and we also use the templating system that that you expect one. And finally, we are using also require.js that is a JavaScript library for handling uh, dependencies and require, write, include new JavaScript files. Um, uh, we also using a uh, Google Cluster Lint that is uh, like a code checker for, for checking the, the, the code. And we are using also some cool CSS3 features like transitions uh, that makes the app the app feels native in in iOS. We 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 use hardware accelerate effects for, for transitions, for animations, and it's pretty cool. Um, well, uh, this is how it looks, the, the, the application for, for a phone. You can download the, the application for, uh, from the Go uh, Google Play Store on, on the Android app market. Just search for Moodle Mobile. Uh, if you Enter here a student or teacher. This is automatically pointing to Moodle demo site, so you are automatically logged. So you can test the application. And uh, well, this first version is pretty simple, but it works very, 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 very well. Um, I think we did a, a, a very good job for this initial version. As Martin said, there are the test strategy. The, we are thinking that um, this application is going to be focused in uh, offline and notifications and also using uh, uh, the phone hardware features like the camera and the audio recorder. We are not going to create a Moodle in your pocket, Moodle in your in your hand. Uh, this is just uh, a very small application for flying and for for mainly for notifications. So we we can uh, we can uh, use. Uh, a mobile theme like Bootstrap or my my mobile, in combination with with this application, so you you have a good experience using a a mobile theme theme in Moodle, and you have an a native application for Android and for iOS, for yes notification and, and offline. Um, the the we we are we are going to support the application for iOS and for for Android, but the application can be also be used in in Windows Phone and other operate and other another mobile operating systems because uh, since we use PhoneGap for PhoneGap for building, there are, there is a cross compilation to multiple uh, operating systems, so it's it's very interesting. And um, that's all. Any question? No? Uh, no, there might be one. It's just there's some lag. So give it a little few seconds. Well, thanks to uh, Jerome uh, and Barbara as well, who did an awful lot over the past few months. Um, but uh, Juan did the bulk of the um, the, uh, the coding. So thanks, Juan. Um, thanks for the overview. It's really good. It's so good to have it up in the stores now. It's in the uh, iTunes store of BIOS and on Android, so Google Play. Um, 
and uh, keep building it and encouraging community to add on to it as well. So it's a whole project like Moodle, really. Um, and uh, it's all under the Apache license. So it's all, G it's all open source, and you can um, take it, modify it. You don't have to give anything back. Um, so it's, it's more open than GPL, actually. Um, Rex, don't know uh, about that link you posted. Um, the yeah, you're right, Tim. Um, the um, uh, the the push notifications use as well. Jerome, you want to talk a bit about it? The Yes, uh, push notification, it uses uh, air notifier. So when you send a push notification from Moodle, it goes through the messaging API. And uh, the messaging provider sends it to uh, software uh, that we created, the function created uh, air notifier. And air notifier send it to Apple and uh, Later, I think you will send it uh, to uh, Google as well. And then uh, Apple or Google, uh, they send it back to your, to your mobile. That's it. All right, cool. Anything else to say? Did we forget anything, Jerome? Uh, no. But Oh, it's going good. And what the trees that would be a good looking uh, app that would be very good. <laughs> yeah, the interface is, is really uh, a really nice, um, a nice interface. I actually would like Moodle to look more like that app over the coming months. Um, I think it's a pretty good example of a, of a simple interface on touch screens. Okay, uh, well, the last thing on the list, but not the least, is Michael Durant talking about Google Summer of Code. Yeah, um, so I guess... Uh, uh, I can't switch off the screen. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so do you want the mouse to put anything up? No, no, I, I just briefly mentioned that... Um, uh, so we're, we've been accepted for the Google Summer of Code again this year. Uh, I guess the stage that we're up to is receiving applications. So those applications should be coming in from students over the next week and a bit. We, um, uh, we've got more projects this year than we have had in the past. I don't know how many applications we'll end up with as a result. Um, hopefully we'll get some good students this year. Uh, that's always the, the main thing is doesn't matter how many applications we get. Uh, the main thing is that we get some some good students. Um, yeah, you you may have seen students already around asking questions. Um, if you're not involved in the projects, you could probably ignore that. Or, or, although you know you're also welcome to to give a hand to students that are uh, involved. Um, yeah, and then uh, when the projects start. After the students are accepted, um, please be supportive of, of the students as they go through the Google Summer of Code. They may ask for you know various at, at various points community input um, on proposals uh, and perhaps even testing of code. Um, so uh, that'll happen mostly between June and September. That's about it. Cool. Um, but the very next day was for uh, accepting the. Yes. Yeah, so the applications are due on the third of May, US oh, wow. time. Okay. So that's not long. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, we're probably all tired. Uh, I think we'll. Wrap it up. For, uh, it was a long meeting. Uh, what do you think about this mode of, for the experiment of uh, broadcasting it this way? 
um, plus one, minus one. Uh, yes, the live stream is saved on um, video on YouTube there, so we'll leave it there. Um, well, yeah, uh, I'm not I'm not dissing Big Blue Button at all. Uh, uh, in fact, they're just putting out a new version with a lot of improvements, so I might try that again as well. I mean, I like to support that open source project, but um, this we had a peak of 70 viewers there or more. Um, and quite a lot of um, things. So it'll be interesting looking at how what, how that works. But uh, um, I have to say, after running it for two hours, the um, interface on the Mac OS X in Chrome started to crumble a bit. <laughs> so yeah. certain buttons are not working, but we're still broadcasting. So yeah, yeah, who knows? Haven't killed it yet. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you all for coming uh, and. Uh, uh, we have a couple of weeks of intense polishing and 2.5 will be out and uh, it's on to 2.6. Um, but definitely I think we need a party after this release because of some kind. So thanks all. Thanks for coming along. See ya. Anyone else want to say anything? Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> See ya. Right. See you guys. Right. We need a catchphrase. Some sort of a have a mojito or something. More than rules. <laughs> what? More than rules. Little rules. We actually do have a, we have a gang sign, which I can't show you on the video because uh, it's not. <laughs> I can't switch to it anymore. <laughs> uh, see you all. Thanks all. Bye.